So for those who don't know me, I'm Andrea Citrullo, that's my name, and I'm program curator at Teatro Mundi, among other things. Um, so yeah, I was saying that I'm going to read from this book, which is a wonderful book I recommend to everyone. So if you can write it down right now, please do it. It's Jason Mohagic, Jason Babak Mohagic. He's an Iranian-American philosopher. I hope he's watching. Um, and the book is called Night, a Philosophy of the After Dark. So because it is the Architectural Foundation, I chose to read the introduction as well as the as chapter one that is about time and space, the, architecture, the architect's night. So yeah, I think that's about it. I will just, well, the book basically, it's why is it so wonderful? It's, it's wonderful just stylistically, the way it's written, very sophisticated, the analogies, the metaphors that Jason uses. But in regards to night, I think it captures and depicts night in such a way, um, it, it, it goes into the characters that inhabit it, uh, the different temporalities of night, uh, the sensorial experiences, it captures that wonderfully. And yeah, the ways in which these characters or figures, hello everyone, <laughs> uh, navigate ni the nighttime. So yeah, I'll start with my reading. So. To study night, one must stare into one what one one realizes intuitively as a paradoxical object. That night is where horror thrives, and also infatuation. That night hides certain acts, but that things are also said to come out at night. That we are surprised and caught off guard by its sudden noises, while also recognizing its calm familiarity. And that even night's mythological child, sleep, is no safe bet, dualistically bringing both dreams and nightmares, meaning and nonsense, to the oblivious mind. Beyond this, we must engage night through the varying prisms of its most fascinating practitioners, namely those who keep strange hours and navigate the different potentialities of nocturnal experience, both of terror and enchantment. For the criminal's relation to the dark, fugitive, dealer, prowler, is not the same as the wanderer's relation, nomad, sojourner, sleepwalker, nor the many other sub-identities whose survival relies upon a, a certain exact mastery of night's formulas and upon learning its conceptual experiential relations to time, space, fear, nothingness, desire, death, forgetting, enigma, solitude, sensation, vision, secrecy, monstrosity, and the body. To stay vigilant and wakeful throughout, to keep watch while others close their eyes. Night as universal overthrow. Night brings revolution against the archetypal. It overthrows the dominant hierarchies and universal myths in favor of the beautiful disarray of the masquerade or bonfire. It is where one fathoms otherwise, the time-space of the visionary, the imaginary, the unreal, the unknown, the elsewhere, the outside, and the emergent. It is where one first builds machinations of radical thought, letting fall those droplets of mad and dangerous consciousness. The governing categories of human existence are suspended for the meanwhile, and in their place pour forward the semblances of alternative classifications and diagrams, band libraries, archives, catalogues, arrangements. There has been an ancient war across the fields of philosophical inquiry, and in this violent conflict, two diametrically opposed sides. On the one front, those movements aligned with perceiving philosophy as enlightenment, and thus inescapably tied to discourses of truth, absolutism, and idealism that would render ours a radiantly serious, legitimate discipline. Tradition, structure, reason, 
and systemic orders of the mind follow in their wake. And on the other front, these movements aligned with perceiving philosophy as dark track and thus inescapably tied to discourses of chaos, exception, obscurity, and fragmentation that would render ours a deviant criminal enterprise. Originality, distortion, tremor, and rough speculation follow in their wake. For one alliance, the light promises a certain stability of being, desire for groundedness. For the other alliance, the night provides gateways and trajectories of, being, of becoming, desire for, desire for flight or freefall. In this way, it is a war between the throne and the open sea, a war between significance and the ingenious manipulation of meaning within the folds of pure meaninglessness. The conceptual schism between day and night, therefore, marks the existential border between those with pathological need to rule and those with a diabol diabolical impo impulse to abandon, subvert, and reinvent the game of mortal experience. So now I'm going to read chapter one, that is Counterfuturity, Dark Time Space, The Architect's Night. I think before I start reading this chapter, it's quite important that I show you the, the place I will be describing and talking about. That is um, a nightclub in Beirut. Let's see if you find the picture. Here it is. So you can have an idea, I hope you can see it. All right, so this is the nightclub during the day or something like that and the night. So have a look before I start reading about it so you can imagine the space. Philosophies of night should rightly commence from an awareness of the night travelers. Those who master patterns of nocturnal movement and intricately choreograph their infiltrations or escapes around the hours of mass oblivion. Many conceptual figures rise to the imagination, each with their own techniques, ambitions, and sensorial orchestrations of the dark intervals. The thief's night, the runway's night, the harlot's night, the drunkard's night, the insomniac's night, the revolutionary's night, the hysteric's night, the Sorcerer's Night, The Architect's Night. All must learn to motion while others fall still. All must grow restless while others stay at rest. This exploration of the phenomenological experiential domains of the night traveler will revolve around two distinct works, of which I am going to read only one. Uh, that is the nightclub that I just showed you in Beirut, and that is case one. Hello. <laughs> case one, uh, which is the BO18 nightclub in Beirut, Lebanon. Architect, Bernard Corey, 1998. Situated in a bombed out, devastated district known as the Quarantine, quite relevant, Named after the old quarantine sites for foreigners arriving from the nearby ports, it later formed the grounds for Armenian, Kurdish, and Palestinian refugee camps cleansed during the country's civil war. Today, this nightclub is placed underground in the ominous shape of a bunker with a large retractable metallic roof that opens and closes each hour past midnight. So it is that several morphologies of the night traveler intersect here, both past and present. Those of the old boat passengers once placed under enforced isolation, those of the exiles displaced from occupied homelands, those of the marauding sectarian factions who patrol city street, streets each night, opportunistically equating darkness with ideology and blood those of the slaughtered minorities who traverse into non-being before the death squad. 
and lastly, those of our era's night revelers, who summon themselves to this strange place over and again, like a doomsday ritual. Night, ta night travel and time. Pio 18 is a music club, a place of nocturnal survival. So this is a quote from the architect himself, Bernard Cory. And there are many intricate temporalities woven into the steps of Pio 18's Night Traveler. From restive inception to exhaustive aftermath. From the pandemoniac moment of encounter to the minute of futile return. To start from the bookends of this nocturnal process, there are the macro-temporal experiences of entering and exiting, which allow the club two separate mysterious powers. One, to seal the night traveler within its own sovereign cube of unworldly time. Two, to then mercilessly release its guest back into the time of the real, last call. These are complex practices aligned with emergent dusk and dawn respectively. First, we witness the hyper-anticipatory nervous system of the arrivals, waiting in line outside with rigid postures. Then, we witness the closing time eviction, embodied in the slackened torsos of the leaving crowd that resemble zombies staggering into grey sunlight. I think we can all identify with that. Thus, the once ancient nocturnal roles of the lamplighter and the lighthouse keeper have been translated into the postmodern, their postmodern counterparts of the club manager, who turns artificial light switches to formally inaugurate the nighttime, and the doorman, who scans on oncoming presences from near and far. Like all station guardians, they literally open and close the gates to a certain exclusive timescape. Two, the next temporal strat stratum to consider happens inside the club itself, that of the inner middle experience of the night out, which passes like an impressionistic sky, liquid or vaporous, without demarcation. They close their eyes, they sway, gesticulate, smile, they drink refined liquors, they feign loss of control. But this is neither transcendent time nor transgressive time. Like all decadent modalities, there lies a bitter undercurrent beneath the surface of play. This is why they stage their reverie amidst the blast debris of the filthiest district in the city, the gesture itself harboring an element of spite. It is not transgressive because of the non-hierarchical awareness that their, that their entire collective existence is but a mark of evil ruination. It is not transcendent because the slum is the true face of the city. What we get instead is an end of the world show, the time step of a plague dance. Three, this brings us to our final temporal amalgamation one that alchemically mixes both the ghost time and the survivor's time. Let's not forget that the supposed display of the hedonistic present is physically built on the remains of refugee camps liquidated during civil war just one generation prior. Our nocturnal architect, however, has gone to great lengths not to conceal the bullet-ridden apparitions of the obscenity, but rather to encase it in the very walls and ground that shallow his patrons each night. Swallow, sorry, his patrons each night. The club itself is therefore a blunt force instrument of enunciation of this killing affair. Its inexorable electronic beats are pure death rattle. The music funnels back only to the catastrophic imagination. The structure indulges the haunted, haunted mind to its nth degree at once appearing to blend survivor's guilt with the survivor's addictive rush of invincibility. And yet, the club's time game goes even further, for while survival is based on a temporal assumption of the closure of violence, requiring a concept of the elapsed event, 
This sunken enclosure beneath the earth channels all adrenaline into the disclosure of but one simple fact. That no one made it out alive. The war is not yet over. Yes, there is an error that took place here, and it remains the decry site of error making. Hence, the night travelers do not raise their glasses in denial. They raise their glasses in recognition of the ever violating decades, toasting the unforgivable. How much time? Oh, we got time. Great. Um, so yeah, I have showed you the image already, so I'm going to start uh, describing the different sections that conform the nightclub. And this is part two of chapter one, night travel and space. The opening of the roof exposes the club to the world above and reveals the cityscape as an urban backdrop to the patrons below. Its closing translates a voluntary disappearance, a gesture of recess. The building is encircled by concrete and tarmac rings. The automobile circular traveler travel around the club and the concentric parking spot frame the building in a carousel formation. To understand the spatial dynamics of our first night traveler typology, one must make a careful inventory of the architectonic features of the BO18 spectacle. Notably, that of the sector, the staircase, the rooftop, the lot, the tomb, and the target. One, sector. We must first remember that we are starting in the quarantine, a neighborhood originally synonymous with segregation, rejection, stigma, and the millennial fear of the outsider as disease. Again, quite relevant. Half a century later, it becomes the abyssal ground for lethal purging of refugees at the hands of extremist circles, betraying one's sacred oath of sanctuary, oath of sanctuary and asylum in the name of cruel gods. Thus the site remains scarred by its previous operational logic, half camp, camp, half ruin. Today, however, the quarantine sector is known for housing two sensorially unwanted industries, those of the garbage facilities and the slaughterhouses. Thus, the area's perimeter is met always with the wafting odor of animal blood and refuse. It is a place of residual funk, where the dirty work of the city's everydayness gets done off the radar. The trash collector, the butcher, these are the true kings of this domain into which our night nightclub travelers wander. Side note, just adjacent to the site, not far beyond a few half-condemned buildings, is the ever-idealized presence of the ocean. Hence the sound of lapping waves, the smell of salt water, and the vistas of the North Mediterranean coastline commingle at close distance. Consequently, one wonders, is it wrong for boundless space to be teasingly located at the foot of a carceral shantytown killing field? Two, staircase. There is a clear infernal dimension to the staircase that takes one into BO18. Like all ladders reaching into subterranean depths, as if the existential cost of the banquet, feast, festival, and masquerade were that of, step were that of stepping into hell itself. More precisely though, the lowered concrete staircase acts to conjure reminiscence of, reminiscence of the old bombardments when the city sirens and alarms would announce oncoming airstrikes, stage of siege, fire raining from smoke invaded skies. In such, in such instances, one runs instinctually downward for shelter into the barricade, the trench, the capsule, the chamber, and the club diabolically preserves this impulse, carving visitors into a gesture of emergency confinement. Rooftop. The architect tells us 
that his buildings are devices. Devices. And so we asked what creative stealth is served by a massive metallic roof and its hourly hydraulic retractions. What mechanistic cunning is embedded into this immense contraption that at once protects and exposes the night travelers to the urban squalor around them? That was a question. This intermittent revelation signaled by the creaking of steel parts is the antithesis of escapism. The convertible ceiling disallows one from surrendering oneself too completely to the anti-gravity feeling of the dance and its floating sonic palpitations. It abruptly restores one to the awareness of space as armament, not an escape, but rather a sinister tribute to the inescapable, a few seconds delayed. Lot. There is a carnivalesque aspect to the makeshift parking lot, which sits on top of the actual club space, like a sculpture garden of abandoned machines placed together in odd striations. This is the carousel formation of which the architect speaks. And yet the exceptional stillness of their painted aluminum bodies also gives off, off a funeral quality, something closer to fossilized bones as, as if now deprived of their rightful owners in the wake of an epical dystopia, leaving only a cemetery or museum of technological archaisms. Is the lot therefore the perfect speciality of obsolence, a simulacrum for our surrounding chaos, no driver at the wheel? On the other hand, one can also read a dark aristocratic atmosphere in the above ground lot, almost like the park carriages of a secret society at a secured estate in the woods. An esoteric portal then, for those dabbling in passwords, occultism, and forbidden services. So we got, I'm going to read one more. I'm going to read the tomb. That's part five. To what extent is the club's physical submergence several meters below ground an attempt to transfer its patrons into a mass grave? Note its corridors are termed airlock spaces. To what extent are these night travelers participating in the sly brutality of an architect's desire to bury them alive? At the front end, we have a DJ's platform rise up to resemble a colorful art altar though merely caricaturing the absent sacrosanct. And above our heads, the corroded roof now seemingly functions as an overhanging coffin lid. Indeed, the architect speaks further of a certain macabre aura to his design, meaning perhaps the very black humor absurdity that accompanies such night gatherings, namely, the luxury of slightest fortune through which some have persisted semi-breathing amid the many mounds of an otherwise exterminative modernity. And yet this half-life does not sit well with them, the night travelers. Hence, they come to the BO18 to finish the job. A quest for finality itself, once and for all, the compound of a suicide cult. I don't know if that's the best way of finishing, but it's uh, what it is. And I think we are approaching the time. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for listening. I hope you enjoyed the reading. And yes, it was a pleasure to read to all of you this uh, little lullaby. And yeah, have a, have a great evening, everyone. <laughs>